Craghead is the name is the name of the village, and from it there's quite a lot to see. Beautiful countryside all around. Even though it's a mining village, and you don't expect beautiful countryside, but there's also plenty of historical interest, particularly interest around Michael Heaviside. The wood behind me is called Heaviside Wood. Who on earth is Michael Heaviside? Well, we're going to explore that as we go and see some of the interpretation boards around the village that explains something about Michael Heaviside and his bravery because Michael Heaviside was not just Mr Heaviside he was Michael Heaviside VC Victoria Cross great man so let's investigate the area <laughs> Heading down towards Stanley. Quite a steep hill this. To the left is the site of the war memorial. And a small park around it. Bus heading out towards Durham. We're coming up now to the house of one of the mine managers. That could have been the mine owner. It's a, a really interesting house. I, I guess it's 19th century, something like that. There we are. This is this is the place. Really nice. What I find interesting is this. The house is built right by the side of the road, so it's not nowhere I'd want to live. But of course, things in, in the days when this was built, this, this road was not so busy. But if you look closely here, you can just about see a Posse's arrow. There, there, there. And this, the benchmark. So a surveyor used to be able to come along here, look at the thing and say, ah, now I know where, where I am and what height we are. And you can still look that up today, even though to these days, nobody needs benchmarks. Now, if you were coming to do this walk by bus, you'd be wanting to get off at this bus stop down here. Uh, you'd either catch the 78 out from Consett, or the number 16 either from Durham or from Stanley. And you'd be looking on the signboard, or you'd be asking for the font. Uh, font meaning Bloemfontein, because like many places around the country, the war in South Africa, the Boer War, was uh, commemorated, perhaps even celebrated, by naming streets and areas. So this area is called the Font, Bloemfontein, Bloemfontein Terrace. And the link, of course, with uh, uh, Michael Heaviside is that he lived on Bloemfontein Terrace, although his house no longer exists. So either the 16 or the 78. So you're going to be walking north, from the bus stop. This is the font, the nice open space. And uh, another memorial of the mining nature of this area. There's no pit wheel, which is interesting, but you do have this. 1997 Craghead Colliery. So now we're just heading along North here, right towards the end of it. On the left hand side of the road is uh, Bloemfontein Primary School, and on the right we get the first real marker to our, in our walk to Michael Wilson Heaviside, who was born in uh, Gilesgate, Durham City, and later moved to Kimblesworth, then Sacriston, and then eventually here to, uh, to Craghead. 
we'll read about what he did, what earned him his VC, when we come to his grave. It's a bit too noisy here to record that. But here is his marker, and there's the simple description. We could see bullets striking the ground right around the spot over which Heaviside was crawling. Every minute we expected to be his last. But the brave chap went on. Yes, he did. And eventually came back to Craghead, restarted work as a miner, and died in 1939. And here's a depiction of his medal. Private Michael Heaviside, Durham Light Infantry, 6th of May, 1917. So, just to extend the work, I'm going to be continuing past Bloemfontein Primary School and heading along, because just to walk straight back to his grave doesn't take too long. But if we walk along here, we'll join up with another local path, the Southmore Heritage Trail, and see one of the markers from there, uh, which is really interesting because there's actually a, phys a physical building left over from the mining times. So here we are. Let's enjoy the walk. Not too far to go. To the right, just past the golf course, in front of open fields, are these two houses. Now, they don't look much, in fact, they aren't that much, but they're the remnants of what used to be the hospital for the miners, the mining hospital. It was paid for by the mine owners and by the mine workers themselves, and uh, the hospital itself used to stand on the land just behind. It's now a modern housing estate just being de developed. Now, we've moved out from Craghead and we're just on the edge of South Stanley, heading towards the district called Southmore. And here we come onto the Southmore Heritage Trail. And uh, what we're seeing over here is the miners' rescue station. The decision to build a rescue station at the foot of West House Lane on the road from Southmore to Craighead is first mentioned in the Southmore Colliery Viewers Report of 1912. The viewer managed all the underground and surface working at the colliery and he had to comply with the Coal Mines Act of 1911, which required all mine owners to establish rescue stations, provide teams of trained rescuers and to keep and maintain rescue apparatus. That 1911 Act followed several mining disasters, including the West Stanley Burns pit explosion of 1909, which, in which 168 miners died. The hospital that we passed earlier was the welfare hospital of the Craghead and Southmore Collieries. It was opened in 1927. At the ceremony, the Southmore Band was headed by a new lodge banner, the front depicting the new hospital. The hospital cost over 24,000 and was uh, 24,000 pounds. Uh, it was funded by the recently introduced Miners' Welfare Levy, levy. so it's paid by the colliery owners with weekly contributions from miners' wages. Wow. And so from here you can join the Southmore Heritage Trail, which takes you up through quaking houses. It's a really interesting site, and you can, you can learn quite a lot about miners' lives in the 19th and 20th centuries. This behind the, uh, the fence is the rescue station. It's not a lot to look at now, but it, it was there and they had trained miners who were worked underground. They could rescue their, their fellow miners. They knew what to do. They could apply first aid. They knew how to, how to keep places safe. Wonderful. So what we're doing now is we're heading south out of South Stanley away from South Moor, we're heading on up the hill towards the two wind turbines and this is a byway. It used to be a road but nobody uses a road anymore. It's a byway and takes you up through open countryside on the right with the golf course on the left and it's a really really beautiful beautiful walk. Just further on up the byway a little bit steeper now. 
golf course is behind us to our left. Bits of the golf course are still on the right, but it's open country now over that direction. And about 400 metres across, that would have been the site of the National School where the children from Southmoor and of uh, Craghead used to go. Well, we're now at the highest point of our walk and uh, we're turning left down into Craghead. But the thing that you need to remember and I need to point out to you is that Craghead is a, is a mining mining uh, town, mining village, needs to take the coal from somewhere to somewhere else. And what we're on now is, while it may be the road up towards Burnhope, it, that, this road was also tracked by a single line railway line. And they used to take coal, uh, coal from Burnhope along here. Originally it would have been hauled by horses, but later by steam engines, and it would then go, go down into Craghead. There it would meet the, the colliery there. And there's quite an extensive system of, uh, of colliery, of, mine, of uh, train workings down there, including a very special engine called the Wylam Dilly. More of that later. And so now we're walking down into Craghead. Oh, really good road. Not hardly, hardly any traffic at all. I mentioned that there was a railway, railway line that carried coal from Burnhope. You can't see any real trace of it. There's no lines, of course. There's no points. There's no, there's no sidings. But this is where the railway line crossed the road and went into the colliery buildings of Craghead. So came cross country, originally by horse, later by, later by train, and joined along with the rest of the railway network, taking coal from Craghead down into Gateshead, probably to the staves there, and then loading onto the, the ships that took coals from Newcastle down south. Um, this is the road into into Craghead, heading down towards the punch bowl. And what we're going to do is we're going to turn right and see a bit down the back street. So it's not how it originally looked, of course. So here we are, right at the top of Craghead. Behind, you can see some of the old coal mining works. That would behind is is the washery where they used to uh, to. Uh, clean the coal up, remove the stones and whatever and then it'll go from there to the trains and what I'm standing on now it was actually part of the uh, coal yard where they used to load the wagons and shunt the wagons so you can imagine at night or well, all through the day to be honest there'd been clanking and banging of wagons there'd be the hooting of whistles the engines would be moving backwards and forwards all the time the pit heads wheels would be going you'd hear the steam engines and later the electric motors that drove them it was a busy busy place where hundreds of miners were employed and now after that walk through the center i can imagine i can smell smell the coal because all these houses would have had coal fires and you'd get the you'd get the smell of the smoke ah, beautiful not healthy but beautiful and now what I'm doing, I'm walking along Railway Terrace. And this is Railway Terrace. So named because it's the terrace on the railway. And we're walking right where the engines would have run. The houses originally, of course, would not have been uh, open back like this. There would have been an outside toilet for people to, to use, because that's the way that it was. There wasn't mains drainage, there was earth closets. It was primitive in the early days. And so here we see something, this is on the, on the Twizel Burn Heritage Trail. You see something about the Twizel. The Wylam Dilly, which was a very famous engine, which is now up uh, 
at the National Museum in Scotland. Uh, why it's there I don't know, but here we are, we've got the commemoration of the history of coal mining in this area. But we've got to get back to Michael Heaviside, and for that we're going to head to St Thomas's Church. So we're still on Railway Terrace. The railway itself was slightly lower down, it was in a, more of a cutting here I'm told, and went uh, under Lowry Lane, through a bridge, and came out the other side, down towards the uh, the, the, the colliery paymasters. But we're turning right to St Thomas's Church. If you want to see Michael Heaviside's grave, you need to come in through the front gate of the church, St Thomas's Church, and then you need to head to to the left of the church. So let's follow that right now. Then you head up through the churchyard there is a slight track that you can see. There are a number of Commonwealth war graves but the one that you're looking for is slightly marked. There's a coping stone around it and here is the grave of Michael Heaviside, VC. So here we are, Michael Heaviside's grave. It's very simple, it's just the, the standard Commonwealth War Graves uh, grave. It's here in St Thomas's churchyard. It's now a private residence, but the churchyard is obviously still used. Michael Heaviside, VC, from the Durham Light Infantry. Most conspicuous bravery and devotion to duty. Died the 26th of April 1939, aged 58. I want to read the citation for what he did. He was 36 years old and a private in the 15th Battalion, the Durham Light Infantry, British Army, during the First World War at the Battle of Arras, when the following deed took place for which he was awarded the VC. On the evening of the, 15th, uh, of the 5th of May 1917, the battalion returned to their barricades on the Hindenburg Line near fontaine les croissy France. Only 100 yards separated the British and German positions, but the terrible fighting of the preceding days had died down. Snipers and machine gunners were, however, still active, and any movement attracted deadly fire. And at about 2 o'clock in the next afternoon, on the 6th of May 1917, a sentry noticed movement in the shell hole about 40 yards from the German barricade. A wounded British soldier was desperately waving an empty water bottle. Any attempt to help this soldier in daylight would result in almost certain death for the rescuers. Michael Heaviside, however, said that he was going to try. Grabbing water and a first aid bag, the stretcher bearer scrambled over the barricade and out into no man's land. Immediately he came under heavy rifle and machine gun fire from the German positions. He was forced to throw himself to the ground. He then began to crawl 60 yards across the broken ground from shell hole to shell hole to where the wounded soldier was sheltering. One eyewitness later wrote, we could see bullets striking the ground right around the spot over which Heaviside was crawling. Every minute we expected to be his last, but the brave chap went on. As he crawled close to the German lines, the firing increased. The enemy seemed to be more determined to hit him, for the bullets were spluttering about more viciously than ever. When Private Heaviside reached the soldier, he found the man nearly demented with thirst, for he'd been lying badly wounded in the shell hole for four days and three nights, without any food or water. Michael Heaviside gave the soldier water dressed his wounds, and then promised that he'd return with help. That night, Michael Heaviside let two other stretcher bearers out across no man's land to the wounded soldier and carried him back to safety. Without doubt, he had saved the man's life. The London Gazette announced the award of the Victoria Cross to Private Michael Heaviside on the 8th of June 1917 for his most conspicuous bravery and devotion to duty. He was the third soldier of the Durham Light Infantry to gain this award during the First World War. 
he was lucky he returned home he returned to mining lived in Craghead on Bloemfontein and he died in 1939 what a man he would have been what a story he might have told but my guess is that he probably kept it to himself and so now on with the rest of our walk but please make sure you take some time to visit the grave of Michael Heaviside VC an ordinary man who turned out to be a great hero and so we need to return to the start of our walk it really isn't far now we just go up the hill and then we'll be turning right following down through some nice woodland and so here it is we turn right we're just getting onto the route of what used to be the colliery line we're actually on the line at the moment the path would have been slightly to the uh, to the right but we now head down go into these woods the woods are the Michael Heaviside woods so his contribution to the safety of our nation is, is marked by the creation of a wood And so we come back to the start of our walk. Hope you've enjoyed it. Michael Heaviside Trail and a little bit of the Southmore Heritage Trail, which is really worth exploring because there's so much more to see. Have a good day. Enjoy your walking.